start, I'm gonna, if, I, if I look over to the left, uh, it's, it's, I'm going to try to get the people who are calling on, our, on the Skype phone number. Uh, we're having a little bit of difficulty there, but welcome to worship on March 20, what is it, March 29th uh, at Silver Lake United Methodist Church. My name is Alex Rosson, I'm the pastor of this worshiping community, and it's a joy to have you worship with us. I'm grateful for Steve to come in and to help with the audio and video this week. And our, our hope is that uh, you feel God's presence in the, in the words that you hear, the songs that we sing, the scriptures we read, and the prayers we pray. And with, with that in mind, I have a, a couple of announcements that I'd like to share with you all. Uh, and, and one is with the, the information that keeps on coming out is uh, the next potential worship date that we might have together in person at this time is, is May 2nd, but that continues to be updated. And as we uh, learn more information from uh, Shawnee County, the state of Kansas, and the federal government, we'll keep you all informed uh, uh, through email, through letters, and on, on Facebook. So stay up to date that way. Uh, starting this week, uh, uh, Wednesday, uh, the, the school will also be uh, serving lunches in our community, uh, April 1st, and they'll be serving them from 11 to 1. And so how are we as a community going to continue our ministry in that way so we can uh, continue to minister to those people who need uh, food and, and hunger is how we are going to uh, starting Wednesday be serving meals from 12 to 2 uh, for people who can't uh, make it to the school uh, to get lunches but up until this point we've served and in, in two weeks that we've been doing it we've served around 300 lunches and it's been a powerful uh, manifestation of how God is moving uh, through you all who have, have gave generously to the sack lunches, uh, to those who have sacked the lunches, to those who have shopped the lunches. And I just want to say it is amazing to see the Spirit move through you and to uh, go out in our community and be uh, beacons of love and hope uh, amongst the, the uncertain times where sometimes people don't know where their, their food is coming from. And so I wanted to, to give you a, a hand clap of praise for that. And to also say thank you for letting the Spirit move through you and serving in all those different ways. Uh, secondly, is a, a, if, you, if you, a couple of you joined on Tuesdays at noon, we're doing a, a live devotions on Facebook. And so if you have the opportunity to, to come to Facebook, I invite you to uh, join a short, brief devotion, whether you're at work, you're at home. Uh, and that will be from 12 to 2, or from 12 to 1230. Uh, I think last week it lasted 10 minutes, so it's not, it's a quick devotion so we can connect with each other and connect with God. And then also the, the New Testament Never New study meets uh, on Wednesdays at 6.30. This last week, this coming week will be the last week that we meet, and then we'll transition to another study. And that's 6.30 on Zoom, and that link uh, is available on Facebook and will also be sent out uh, through to you through email. And then lastly, this, this week we're going to start a, a, a calling tree where... Uh, we, we, we call and reach out and connect with everyone just to see how they're doing. Uh, if there's anything that need, that anything that we as a church uh, family can provide and, and, and to them. And so we will, uh, we will continue to uh, be in ministry and connect with one another and have relationship with one another. And so if you're interested, uh, comment, make a comment in the comments. I know a couple of you respond. There's also a place in the... The, my weekly email where you could click and it would send an email to the church email letting me know you're interested. Thank you to those that have said you're interested and uh, tomorrow you will receive more information and my hope is that each one in the community receives a, a phone call from another person in the community. And so there, I want to also celebrate the birthdays this, this week or this past week. This past week Carly Bluebaugh, uh, her birthday was on uh, March 23rd. Brooke Phelps, her birthday was on March 27th. Uh, Jeff Stoffer's birthday was yesterday, March 28th, uh, and then Bob Webb's birthday is coming up this week, and that's on March 31st. And so if you have a, a card handy or if you're on Facebook, make sure to send in a happy birthday message. So with all that in mind, will you please join me in the opening prayer? Dear God, we ask that you calm the gentle waves of our hearts, calm the storms inside of us, still our souls, so we may experience your grace. Still our souls, so we may find rest in you. We have discovered the world doesn't provide the peace we need. Drench all areas of our lives with your peace. Lead us to keep encountering the peace you provide. 
Keep teaching us that nothing in life or death can take away the peace you give. Amen. Um, and so at this time, I invite you to, uh, to we're going to turn the camera around and flip it, and I invite you to sing with me as we sing the hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Most of you probably know this, but if you have a hymnal at home, it's hymn number 349. Let's continue to worship by singing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they are? Who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Notice how the lilies in the field grow. They don't wear themselves out with work, and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you that even Solomon in all of his splendor wasn't dressed like one of these. If God dresses grass in the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow it's thrown into the furnace, won't God do much more for you, you people of weak faith? Therefore, don't worry and say, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? Gentiles long for all these things. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. Instead, desire first and foremost the kingdom, God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so now we will continue to worship by hearing the song, 
trust and obey, and I encourage you to, to sing uh, where you're at.
the emotion of sadness. In the actions that they, these emotions produced with these teachers, sadness, uh, they, the, the actions from that sadness was we see in our, even in our, our community and, and in Topeka, the teachers driving in caravans through local neighborhoods and waving at their students as they go by. Faces lit up with these new realizations of how, how our emotions can uh, nudge us and cause us to take action. Our thoughts create our emotions, and our emotions, when understood and welcomed, can move us to take important actions in the world. And so I was going through uh, the list of emotions, uh, most of uh, the negative emotions I was feeling uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, when, when the news of the virus began to, uh, to, to spread and take a grip on the news, I began to write them down uh, and to, to see what these negative emotions I might have been feeling uh, would led me to do or, or how they were impacting my life. <laughs> so some of these, uh, I, I wrote them down. I said in February, I was, I was in, in Seattle and I was, I was wondering why there were, were all these people uh, going around in masks. I don't think the, the extent of the virus wasn't known at that time. And I was paying attention to China, and I was paying attention to what was happening in Iran and in Italy, and I began to worry. And this worry that I was experiencing drove certain behaviors. Uh, I, I started be, being more apprehensive when I was around large crowds. Uh, plans began to, to be canceled uh, when, that, I, that I knew we weren't going to be able to, to do. We began to, to look at our food and, and our pantry and to take inventory. We might need this or this. What if we are in our homes for 14 days? We might need to stock up on this. We began to, uh, to, I began to check in on family members more frequently. Thank you, Professor Worry. And then in March, I began to feel a different emotion. I began to feel anger. And when I noticed that people weren't taking this as seriously as, as I believed that they should, and so out of anger, I began to talk about uh, and educating myself about uh, staying at home and the best practices for doing that about and looking into how we might flatten the curve. And so eventually, uh, a lot of people began to spoke out and a lot of people are speaking out and, and people are beginning to listen. And that's why we are here today worshiping online together. Thank you again, Professor Anger. And today I still feel a mixture of worry and anger but I also feel a deep sadness because I see people suffering. I see people losing jobs. I see people find, that are financially uh, not, not secure as they were just a week ago, just a day ago. They're, they're missing out on, on cherished milestones with like birthdays of grandkids, birthdays of kids, birthdays of family members, birthdays of friends. People are also getting sick. People are dying. And I, I, I feel sadness. Sadness drives us to compassionate action also. The loving in action of just simply staying put is an act of compassion. Thank you, Professor Sadness. And if, and if you're like me, the, frequently these days, I'm, I'm bored. I'm bored out of my mind sometimes at home, and I can't go out and do the things that I would, would be doing normally. I can't interact with people the way I have been act, interacting before. And so thank you for the Sabbath. Professor Gordon. And so I, many of you, like myself, we also feel a lot of positive emotions throughout this pandemic too. The joy of time with, with my family, the hope of an environmental awakening, a profound sense of unity with all of you, with our community that wasn't there before. The humor of, of memes on social media that cause us to laugh, the gifts that uh, cause us to stir the interaction of sharing photos with people that we haven't shown before, all that interaction is, is fostering unity together. And so all that brings sanity to us as we go through this time together. And you know what? I think it's all right to feel all the feels, to experience all the emotions, and leave space for whatever comes knocking at your door. And so this passage, we, we see, we tell, Jesus says to stop worrying. And so the natural question is, what are they worrying about? And so I ask you that question, what makes you worry? What are you worrying about today? Is it money? Is it the future? Is it whether or not you'll be successful? Is it finding the right partner? Is it the thought of being alone? Is it death? 
Is it losing a parent or child? What are you worrying about today? And we, we always worry about those things, right? And so the, the coronavirus just adds one more thing to the list of things that we can worry about. One more thing to keep us up at night. We've already had enough to worry about. And now we have the time to not only worry about this, but we have the time in our and that time and free space to worry about all those things as well. Before we might have been busy where we didn't we weren't able to take account all those things at once, but now we can just sit and those things begin to pile up. What are you worrying about? And I realize that there's different levels of concern about the virus and how it might affect us, different, different levels of worry. And that's okay. And that's okay. We don't all have to, to worry the same. But this, to some, this pandemic is undoubtedly nerve-wracking. They're in the high-risk category. Experiencing a lot of emotion. Others are perhaps on the, the other end of the spectrum. You might be not so concerned. Instead, you're, you're annoyed that every time you go to the store, they seem to be out of uh, toilet paper and hand sanitizer. And so how much, regardless of how much you are worrying about the coronavirus, it's causing, causing us and, and stirs within us a, a way that we should respond as Christians. How do we respond in a way as Christians that is consistent with the gospel message of Jesus Christ? We are called to be wise. We are called to be sympathetic. We are called to be sensible. We are called to be compassionate. We are called to love. Because before us is an incredible opportunity to display our faith. And you see, Matthew 6, 25 through 34 is in the middle of Jesus's the biggest sermon that he, he, he preaches, the Sermon on the Mount. And in, this, and in this short section of his sermon, Jesus says to not worry three times. And I find it interesting that when I tell someone not to worry about something in the midst of something uh, trying or a trial in their life or something hard that's going on or they're experiencing suffering or pain, it doesn't always seem to work. And I, I begin to look at that, and I, I begin to understand that, that worrying isn't a voluntary thing. It isn't something that we say, okay, I'm, I'm going to worry about this now. It just happens. It comes to the forefront of our mind, and we just begin to worry. We don't say, you know what? We don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I'm going to worry a lot today. So why would Jesus command us not to worry? And I, I, as I looked into the scripture, I, I looked at, at Jesus' words, and I, I think that he's simply not just giving us instructions like a drill sergeant. Instead, he's getting underneath the reasons for our worrying. He's getting to the root of why we worry. And this speaks to Jesus, because when we worry, it affects every part of our body, our soul, and our spirit, and how we live our life. Worry, what does worry do? Worry can lead us to stress, that every day in and day out, when we experience worry and stress, we, we, and we're constantly aware of all the perceived dangers around us, financial dangers, relationship dangers, our health dangers, you find that our body, bodies is always in that stressful condition. Uh, you, you, you stop sleeping, your appetite might go down, you find that eventually you burn out. Maybe you uh, develop uh, ulcers or hypertension or high blood pressure, but that stress of constantly worrying has an effect on our mind, body, soul, and spirit. We get the feeling that when we're, when we're constantly worrying about things, that things are getting thrown at us for no rhyme or reason. You might begin to wonder why it is that God has allowed these certain things to happen, events and circumstances that don't add up from our perspective. You begin to ask why. And then I think go to Jesus' word when he says, do not worry about tomorrow. And it's at the very end of this passage of scripture, he's summing up everything, he else, everything else he had just said. Worry has to deal with the potential and not the actual. 
Worry is being concerned and that, that which, we have, which we can't control. You see, at the core of worry is this desire to control everything that we actually have no control over. That's why we worry. We feel the need to control in an area where there's no possibility of control. Worrying wants us to control the uncontrollable. And then if we go back to the beginning of this scripture in Matthew in verse 25, let's look at how, look, look what he says at the beginning. His first words were, therefore, I say to you. And that's pointing, so when Jesus says, therefore, I say to you, he's pointing to what he previously had said. He's pointing to what he had previously mentioned in the verses before. And you see, these conversations are ongoing conversations that might have happened around a dinner table or in a large group in the synagogue. And so we're jumping in here when we jump on 20, verse 25 of an ongoing conversation that he's having through the Sermon on the Mount. And so right before verse 25, Jesus says in verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and riches. Interesting. Therefore I say to you, therefore I say to you. So in light of what we just read, Jesus says, therefore I say to you. Why does he say that? Well, I think he's pointing out two things and connecting worry to where our treasure is. Well, Jesus knows that we worry about the things that we are most devoted to, the things that we cherish the most. So he starts with the big one. The things that we cherish the most is money. He says if you are devoted to money, then that's what you're worried about all the time. If you think that money is the one indispensable ingredient in the good life, then you will worry all the time about it, about getting it, about keeping it, and not losing it. We tend to worry about the things that we are most devoted to. And so it's a, it, when we think about that, this in the context of the coronavirus, it's not, it's not hard to see why so many people are worrying about it. It is literally having an effect on everything we do. If you are most devoted to your health, worry. If you are most devoted to money, and this is, have, this is having an effect on, the, effect on the economy, worry. If you're most devoted to other people, worry. If you're most devoted to March Madness, worry. If you really wanted to go to opening day, you're worried. It's kind of, that's a joke. I, I didn't hear you laugh, but you, you, you're, you can laugh at that. It's leading to, to worry as we, as we go throughout our daily lives. It's just one thing after another. And it doesn't help if we keep on the news and we see how it's affecting uh, each other and our, our, our family, our community and then the U.S., and then the world, it just leads to worry. And so we look to Jesus, it says, Jesus specifically says, you shouldn't worry about your life. And so when he says that, he is min, 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 uh, pointing to the one thing about one of the major problems of worry. And at the end of the day, our worries, our anxieties, are all about us, our world, our desires, our longings. And so worry, and worrying for Jesus He's not saying it's a bad thing to do. He's saying it's a bad thing to do when it is self-centered. So often when we worry, it's all about us and not about everyone else. Toby Keith wrote a, wrote a country song that, that, that says, when I, when I was reading this and going through this, it's all about me. And it says, and he, put it, he goes, me, 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 not you, 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 you. That's what I think Jesus is saying. The problem about worrying is it's all about us. It's all about me. So when I want you to check in, to go back at the beginning, I ask, what are you worrying about? Was your worry about yourself and me? Was it the worry of us, a collective community? What was your worry? Was it self-centered? And I'm not saying that, that I'm not saying worrying is bad, just like Jesus isn't saying that worrying is bad. But it points us to when we often worry, it is all about ourselves. And you can see this acted out in the, when, when you go to the store, if you've gone to the store, you've seen it on the news. You go to the, the, the supermarket, you go to Sam's, you go to Walmart, you go to Target, and you have witnessed this. People are buying large amounts of, of toilet paper, hand sanitizers, medical masks, 
Some of them are even trying to, to resell them to, to gain a, a profit. And while at first, as the, you might think that they're simply just being entrepreneurs or, or business people, they are since preying on people in crisis. And so the part of the opportunity before all Christians, and for you and I as a faith community, is to find the, the selfless way, the, the humble way of caring in the midst of this unique crisis. And so Jesus in this passage of scripture goes on to ask a series of questions to the people that are listening to the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, he asks them these questions. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? In other words, he's asking, is money really what defines your life? He then gives two examples that demonstrate the following. First, he says, consider the birds in the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Birds, birds don't spend too much time worrying about saving, yet they never seem to lack, because God takes care of them. Second, he says you should consider the wildflowers in the field in verse 28. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. And I haven't met a flower that is worrying about looking pretty or giving off its scent, yet they are beautiful because God adorns their life. And now we, we look at verse 27, and don't miss what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying we shouldn't have genuine concern. And I want to highlight that. Jesus is not saying that we shouldn't have genuine concern or we should not be worried. But he's saying there's a type of worry that is absolutely useless. And by which, which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? And so I, I, I found these statistics on worry, and I thought they were absolutely fascinating. 40% uh, of, of what we worry about never comes to pass. 30% of what we worry about happened in the past and can't be changed. 10% of what we worry about relates to health, even though uh, worrying anxiety makes your health, or plays a part of your health, and makes it, can actually lead it to be worse. 8% of what we worry about is legitimate. But even then, worrying about it, you're worried about it, and that won't change it. So you, hear, the only, so you see, 8% of what we worry about is legitimate. 8%. And I just found those statistics absolutely fascinating about worry. I would have thought that they would have been uh, a little different, but I, I, was, I was intrigued by those statistics. So what are you worrying about? When you worry about something, do you have something in place like a care plan or something that you can do to overcome the worry? Do you have a, a book that you go to, a song that you listen to, a friend that you reach out to, someone that you connect with to overcome the worry. And so the connection that Jesus makes for us here in this passage of Scripture is in verse 32. Jesus connects our worries with our seeking. He says, the Gentiles. And so the Gentiles and that Jesus was speaking to, it would have been a term not only for the, the non-Jewish people in biblical times, but generally it was used for people who don't know God. He says they're the ones that are seeking after all of these things, health, wealth, and possessions. The things of this life that ultimately pass away, that's all they want. That's what they're most devoted to, and that's what they're worrying about. Do you see this connection that Jesus is making between worrying and seeking? When we worry, worry about things, our priorities are revealed. We get worried about things that we put our hope in. That's why earlier in this chapter, Jesus says, your treasure is where your heart is also. In other words, what you're hoping in, what you're investing in, that's what's going to have a grip on your heart, a grip on your desires. So what does Jesus do in this passage of scripture? He gives us something better to be devoted to. In essence, Jesus says, let me give you something else to seek after. It's almost like he says, you want to be worried for something, be worried for this. You want to seek something, seek this. 
Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. But what does that mean? Well, he's already told you in verse 20 that you lay up yourselves treasures in heaven. Invest in eternal things. Don't put your ultimate hope in this life. Put it in the next life. But how do we do that? Well, elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves. To go the extra mile. To turn the other cheek. And to give sacrificially to one another. Seeking first the kingdom of God for Jesus has two things. Remembering our hope of heaven and radically demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ in the here and now to everyone we meet, to everyone we see, to everyone we talk to, to our actions and to our thoughts, to radically show Jesus' love in the world, to love both God, to love your neighbor as you do yourself. So you just see how this, this, this works, the, the hope of heaven and the love that we show to each other are interconnected. And the Christ is the one that allows us to freely demonstrate us that. The Christ frees us from our worries. And so some of you might be saying, wow, that's pretty idealistic, Pastor Alex. But when I researched what the early church did, the movements of the early church, how they took these words to heart of Jesus, they lived them out, and they radically changed the world that they lived in. And so, many of you know I'm a history, I'm my undergraduate degree is in history, and so I love digging into the history of this. And so, in the, in the first century, uh, many of the Christians were probably, we, we read uh, what they were doing, and we can see this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. But recall the former days, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, for you had compassion, in those, compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. What? That is unreal. But then the Apostle Paul goes on and says, You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that, had a better possession and an abiding one. You see the connection, the hope of heaven and the love of Christ. That early Christian community was clinging to the hope of heaven and the love of of Jesus Christ. How can we make heaven a reality now and still cling to the hope of it in the future? You can do that by showing the love of Jesus Christ. And then I went on to, to go to one of my seminary books and I read I read from The Rise of Christianity, the author Rodney Stark, Rodney Stark track, uh, how people became Christians, and he argued in his book that the spread of Christianity in the early centuries was largely due to the care and compassion that Christians showed for the poor and the sick during the differing, different plagues and epidemics. And then uh, the, all those out the centuries, uh, we see more about this in the early, early Christian church. And in the England in the 1800s, many, many, when many were dying of cholera, Charles Spurgeon and his church visited hundreds of homes uh, to people for care. And even now, we, we see that in China and, and Italy, all our people are coming, coming out and even, sorry, Churches in China are on the streets giving out, uh, they were giving out free masks, so they were sharing their food, they were helping the sick. This is what many of you are doing, too. You're coming to the church, stacking lunches, you're going out to the store, buying food, you're coming here and giving out Operation Backpack Packs. You're being Christ's love in the world. What did the early Christians do? What are you doing? How did they do it? How are you doing it? And when we look and answer those questions, we can see because they knew and we know the hope of heaven and the love of Christ. Christians all know that. The Son of God has shown us the greatest love of all. He has died from the sins and risen from the grave. That's, and, and, and when he did that, he separated the, our, our sins as far as the east are from the west. And then three days later, he rose from the dead, grave, conquering death, proclaiming that the worst thing that we're experiencing is never the last thing. And it's this gospel, and this assurance, and this love that we as Christians must share with one another and share with the world. It frees us to invest in people instead of possessions. It frees us to invest minute by minute in each other, in our community, in our relationships, 
and transforming the world to look more and more like the kingdom of God each day. It calls us to put our needs before our own. It calls us to put our needs before others' needs before our own. And so how do we do this when we don't know what the future holds? How do we do this when we don't know what tomorrow brings? I can assure you it doesn't look like a hoarding toilet paper or hiding in the basement. It might look like Christ in a cross. It looks like running towards a need, whatever that might be for you in your situation, not running from it. It looks like sharing our own resources it looks like the type of life that only makes sense if heaven is real, if Christ is alive, and his love is our driving force in our lives. See, friends, even Jesus worried. Even Jesus worried. Luke writes this in chapter 22, verse 44. The sweat became like drops of blood The night before his death. Stop. Merimate, says Jesus. Stop. Worry, says Jesus. But he also says, it's okay to worry. But it's also okay to welcome the other professors in the room, along with Professor Worry. You need to also leave the door open for Professor Trust, Professor Peace, the Professor of Joy, the Professor of Compassion, the Professor of Hope, and the Professor of Love. Will you please join me in prayer? God, I thank you for this community, the ability to worship together and with each other, although we are physically distant from each other. I pray for their protection. I pray for their safety. I pray that for your presence to surround them and embrace them, give them comfort, give them peace, to give them joy, for them to experience your love, and for them to be courageous to show your compassion to the world. Amen. So at this time, uh, we are we're going to do. Uh, a, a virtual offering, and I wanted to thank all those that uh, mailed their, their checks to uh, the church this past week and encourage you, if, if you uh, want to participate in, in the, the offer, offering, you can do it that way, but also uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, if you go to the, the Facebook event of the worship service, there's, there's a link to uh, so you can securely on, give online and worship. And I, I encourage you to do that as we hear the offertory, Why Do We Pray? Thank you. 
Dear God, we thank you for being the God who never sleeps. Thank you for always being here for us, walking with us and walking right beside us, even when we are not always here for you. Thank you that you are love and that you want the very, very best for each one of us. Thank you for your promises and that those promises never change. We are feeling totally overwhelmed right now. Please help us. Help us to rest in the fact that you know what is best for us. Forgive us for turning away from you and trying to control the outcome in, situ in all the situations of our lives. The Bible over and over again says that you are not a God 
of confusion, but that you are a God of peace. Help us to rest in that peace. Help us to rest in your love and to feel the peace which surpasses all understanding. Help us to feel your love and comfort. Help us to be still and know that you are God and that you are with us. Just like any loving parent takes care of their children. Your word says to cast all of our worries and all of our anxieties and all of our fears on you. And in this moment of silence, that's what we do, Lord. We lay out everything that is contained within us, and we give it to you. Lord, we thank you for receiving me for giving us hope, for giving us peace, for comforting us. We thank you for moving through our friends and our family and our community towards us. We thank you for all the ways in which you are moving today. Guide us step by step and help us to be attentive to where your love might be guiding us and where your love might be leading us. And Lord, in this moment, will you help us to pray boldly like the disciples who have modeled their faith to us? Let us connect with them. Let us connect with the saints and pray the same prayer in which Jesus taught his disciples to pray and continues to teach us to pray. So I ask you now to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And the, the last hymn that, that we are going to be blessed with is a, in the faith we sing, and it will be, uh, it's, I have decided to follow Jesus. So I encourage you to uh, sing that with us. And if you don't know the words, it, it starts out with, I have decided to follow Jesus, and goes in a round, and then it goes, the world behind me, the cross before me, and then the third verse is, though none go with me, still I will follow. Please join us in singing that hymn. Thank mm -hmm. you. to hearing, hearing from you and connecting with you. God bless you all. Bye.